All right, let's talk about energy measurements and calculations. So if you're going to calculate energy changes, you need to get familiar with this equation, Q equals mc delta t. Yes, Q equals m times c times delta t. Yes, the triangle is called delta. The meaning of this is Q represents energy flow. A positive value means energy flows into the system, a.k.a. endothermic. Negative value means energy flows out of the system, a.k.a. exothermic. M represents the mass of a sample. C represents the specific heat capacity. Delta T means change in temperature because delta means change, and obviously capital T is temperature. We always use scientific units, of course. Now, uh, in terms of values of Q, like I said, positive value means gaining energy, which means endothermic absorption of energy. Negative value means loss of energy, which means exothermic loss of energy. All right, so, ah, there we go. The equation only applies when there is no change of state. And the reason why is because when the state of a matter is changing, like it's something melting from uh, solid to liquid or vaporizing from liquid to gas, the temperature stays the same. Yes, that's right. If you blow a torch boiling water, it boils because it's at 100 degrees Celsius. You blow a torch, it's still 100 degrees Celsius until it finishes evaporating. Um, if delta t equals zero, then this is zero. And if this is zero, then this whole thing is zero. And to say that it takes zero joules to vaporize the water is not a true statement. So this does not work when a phase change is happening. More about that in the next notes. Okay, so let's look at how you go about solving this and getting an answer that looks like this for your final result. So how much energy is needed to raise the temperature of 7.40 grams of water from 29.0 to 46.0 degrees Celsius? Now this is two calculations. The energy in joules is one calculation. We'll have to do a separate calculation for units of calorie. But either way, notice something. It's asking how much energy, and it's giving a change in temperature. That's how you know you're using Q equals MC delta T, because it asks for energy, and it tells you different temperatures, so the temperature changes. So here's how you go about doing this. You look Q equals MC delta T for your equation. Write it down, in fact, actually. When you go solve this, you need to start by writing down the equation you're going to use to get an answer, because if there's an equation, we need to know where you got your answer from and that you're using your equation, right? So write the bare equation with just variables, no units. Then you can start tracking what you have and what you need. Q, that's energy, but we don't know what it is because that's what it's asking for, so that's why I put question mark. Mass, it's given right there. Specific heat capacity, it will be given to you on a table, on a reference table. You are not ever expected to memorize it, though at this temperature range, we expect you to know that water is a liquid because it boils at 100, so it's a vapor above 100, or it's frozen below zero. So at this temperature range, water is liquid. Um, because you know it's different types of water, like ice and steam have different um, specific heat capacities. So pick the one that's correct to your temperature range. And then delta T. We need to talk about delta T. This is how you get it. Now, how did I get plus 17.0 and why, why is this what it is? Delta T, as a reminder, is your change in temperature. Now understand that when temperature rises, that's a positive change. When temperature falls, that's a negative change. And that's important because there is a formula for delta T. It's final temperature minus initial temperature equals your delta T. And I'm going to tell you, don't try to remember that because if you do, you're going to screw it up and get it wrong. Here's how you get a better way to go about doing it. Um, just remember, positive or, well, temperature change is going to be um, rising temperature means positive delta T. Dropping temperature or reducing temperature means negative delta T. Okay, so if the temperature is rising, it's positive. So these are your two temperatures, 46 and 29. So subtract them in whatever order forces the answer to be positive. Because if the temperature is going up, then make it go up. After all, if you switch this around, have 29 minus 46, you'll still get 17, just negative 17. Don't believe me? Try it on a calculator. It will. All right, so... If the temperature were dropping from 46 to 29, you'd flip this around and make it negative. Uh, but since it's rising, you do it this way so that it comes out as a positive number. Anyway, what you do then after that is you write out the equation but with the numbers this time. So you write it out without numbers, and then you write it with numbers. So Q equals mass 
times specific heat capacity times delta T. And I just put this plus to emphasize that it's not a negative number. So this times this times this, notice gram cancels gram, degrees Celsius cancels degrees Celsius, leaving joule as the unit that you're gonna have for your final answer. Always, always check to make sure that your units cancel properly, which means, by the way, you are required to show units on all your numbers for all your work, including here. Um, you cannot get credit on your test if you just have numbers with no work. Credit will not be given. Okay, so show all your work. Of course, we will not allow no credit if you don't show your work for delta T, and no credit if not showing units for this sort of step here. But anyway, the math comes out to 526 joules, and we can write it either as Q equals plus 526 joules because it's positive, which means it's gained, or you could say 526 joules gained or needed or absorbed or something like that. And then uh, a note about rounding. This does not come out to this. This is rounded to this. It comes out to a much messier number. But you'll notice there's three sig figs here, and that's why I have three sig figs here. Now, one final note about rounding, I know that this could be read as a three sig fig number, but actually, when it comes to delta T, you're gonna ignore sig figs. And the reason why is because you can have like, I don't know, 77.4 degrees Celsius minus 77.3 degrees Celsius. I mean, those are reasonable numbers for three sig figs and you subtract that and it equals 0 0.1 degrees Celsius, which is now just one sig fig. And so it gives the false impression of not having much accuracy and all sorts of things like that happen that could throw off your things. So the simple answer here is ignore sig figs for delta T. Don't ignore them for mass. Don't ignore them for specific heat capacity. Do not ignore them for anything else. This is only for delta T. Do not ignore sig figs for anything else. All right. So it just means delta T does not affect how you round your answer. This is three sig figs, not because of this, but because of this. All right. Uh, oh, yes, we need to do the same thing, but for calories. So check out what we're going to do here. That's your final answer. Different number because calories are a different unit. Now, how did this happen? It's because we write the same equation. We're still, it's the exact same question, just now we're doing calories instead of joules. So it's the same mass. But you'll also get a list of the specific capacities with calories. And make sure you get, if it asks for calories, make sure you choose one with calories because you'll notice it also provides the one with joules. But if you stick this in there, you get the joule answer, which means you're wrong. So make sure if it asks for calories, you choose the calorie number. If it asks for joules, you use the joules number. So, okay. We plug in the calorie number. That way we'll get calories for our answer. It's the same as before. We just subtract the temperatures in order to get the delta T, and because the temperature is going up, make sure it's positive. So then you plug in your numbers just like before, but now instead of the joules, it's the calories number. So this times this times this gives that different number, and then we report it the same way as before. And again, this does not determine our three sig figs. This has three fig sig figs, and so does this one. So these jointly determine that we round to three significant figures. All right, so uh, that's how that goes, and then the rest of these are practice ones that you can look at, but let's move on to other ones, such as this right here. So, uh, example problem 9-2, how, how much, many, oh, typo, how many joules are released when you lower the temperature of 8.69 grams of iron from 312 to 25.0 degrees Celsius? So, how many joules are released? We do the same thing again. It asks for energy, it gives you different temperatures, you know you're using Q equals MC delta T right here. So you write this down. And then you go define your variables. So we're asked how many joules, so that's this. To use your, the mass is given, right there. So that's your M. Your C comes from the chart, 0.45, but don't just write 0.45, have the correct units, joule per gram degree Celsius. That's how you know you're gonna get joules for your answer. If you saw joules and had calories, you know you'd have a problem. Um, as for delta T, we are going to subtract the two numbers, and then once we do that, you have to think, hmm, is the temperature going up or down? So it says when you lower the temperature, that means the temperature is going down, which means you needed negative delta T. That's why this is negative. 
and we subtracted them in whatever order it takes in order to make the answer turn out negative. So in doing that, we have, uh, we have to look at another thing. Remember, this is not going to count for sig figs. So you're going to have three sig figs and two sig figs, and that doesn't matter. So you're going to be rounding your final answer to two significant figures, by the way. But either way, you're going to do your calculation on Q equals the mass times the specific heat capacity times the delta T. And this, of course, is going to make the whole answer turn negative. And then when we round it to sig figs, it comes out to this. And since that's over 1,000, we've got to report that as scientific notation. And it's negative, so negative scientific notation. And you can either use Q equals negative scientific notation, 1.1 times 10 to the third joules, or you can use an absolute value because it's the amount that's released, because negative just tells you it's released, or you can just put the word on there, released, um, given off, or some other synonym like that. All right, and there are, of course, other questions you can look at to practice with this kind of a thing. 9-3, a 1.6 gram sample of metal that has the appearance of gold requires 5.8 joules of energy to change its temperature from 23.0 to 41.0 degrees. Is the metal pure gold? Gold has a specific heat capacity of 0.13 joules per gram degree Celsius. So here's what this is telling you. You are going to assume that every material has its own unique specific heat capacity. So if it matches the specific heat capacity of gold, it must be gold. If it doesn't match, it must be something else. So we're going to solve for specific heat capacity here. Because look, there's the amount of energy. The mass is there. The specific heat capacity being asked for, and the delta T, you can get that from this. So you have everything except specific heat capacity. So you need to solve for specific heat capacity and see if the specific heat capacity of this matches this or not. So here's how you do that. You have to do a little bit of algebra. Now, if you want to rearrange this to solve just for T, we have to fear, sorry, I don't want to say T, C. If you want to get C by itself, you've got to do something. Now, uh, in order to get rid of the delta T and the rid of the M, we've got to do something. Does it? Whatever we do to this side, do we have to do it to just one side in, when we rearrange an equation, or do we have to do it to both sides? Answer that now. Okay, if you're correct, you should say we, only have, we have to do it to both sides. So that means, what do we do to one side, we're going to do to both sides. So I need to get rid of m delta t. Do I divide both sides by m delta t, or multiply both sides by m delta t? Tell me now. All right, I gave you a hint here. I hope you all caught on. We're going to divide both sides by M delta T, and that's not a letter M. Okay, let's try that again. M delta T, M delta T, which means Q over M delta T is equal to C, because M cancels M, delta cancels delta T, cancels T, leaving just C behind. So you can use Q over M delta T equals C. That's how we rearrange algebraically to get C by itself. So, all I have to do is plug in the numbers and get our answer, making sure to show units, of course. What is Q? Q equals 5.8 joules. So that'll go here. What's mass? Ah, mass equals 1.6 grams. And uh, what's delta T? Remember to always show your work for these steps. Don't just write your delta T that came out of your calculator without showing how you got it. It's this. Now, we have to ask ourselves, is it positive or negative? You notice that it requires enough energy to change its temperature from 23 to 41. So temperature is rising. So let's make sure we make this positive. So we'll subtract the one that makes it positive. So we'll do 41.0 degrees Celsius minus 23.0 because that'll make it positive. And that should give a delta T of 18 degrees Celsius. So at that point, you can just plug this in here, this in here, and this right here, and you will get your answer. Now I've got it all animated, all pretty light. So let's get that in there. There we go. So this is, see, this is this, same thing, 
Okay, don't worry about it. C equals this is the same as this equals C. So if you divide Q divided by M delta T makes this, leaving C by itself. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Next, we plug in the numbers. This goes here, this goes here, which is that, and then this goes here, which is that. So this divided by this times this. All right, so um, when you do that, the answer that comes out is that. By the way, it's actually a much more complicated number than that, but you'll notice two sig figs, two sig figs, so rounded to two significant figures. And you'll notice one other thing. Uh, joules per gram degree Celsius is the units of specific heat capacity. So that tells you right there that that's the specific heat capacity of this thing. Now look, this is not the same as this. Because the specific heat capacity of our thing does not match what gold should be, our thing is not made out of gold, or at least not pure gold. Because if you mix gold with something else, that will change its specific heat capacity. All right. So there's more things like that that you can try out and look at. But a lot of this stuff, when you talk about the, the technique used in lab to do some of this stuff, and the methods for measuring energy changes, it's called calorimetry. This is actually, remember that one of the units of energy is calories? And the way they actually figure out how many calories is in food is they do calorimetry with samples of that food in a lab. Um, this is a bomb calorimeter. When you put something inside this container, which is pressurized with pure oxygen, you can burn it. And when it burns, it releases energy. The energy warms the water. You can take a measurement of the water and figure out how much energy was released. Okay, this is what they use to figure out how many calories are in food. Uh, now, the way it works, Q equals MC delta T. If the food burns in here, it releases the energy into this water. So we can take the mass of the water, the specific heat of the water, and how much the water's temperature changed, and we can get the energy absorbed by the water. And since the energy absorbed by the water equals the energy lost when you burn the food or whatever, now you know how many calories are in it. That's how you do it. So energy released or absorbed by the reaction changes the temperature of the water, allowing calculation of energy flow. All right, let's look at what that looks like then. So if you could eat paper, you could calculate how many calories are in that paper. Okay, I guess maybe a goat or something could care, would care about that. But either way, um, we could look at how, many, how much energy is in that paper and how much energy is released when the paper burns. The calorimeter contains that much water, and the temperature of the water rose by that much, calculate Q. All right, now, here's what you do on the test. You've got a change in temperature, and, it's got, and it asks about energy. You know you must use this, so write that equation first. This will not be necessarily given to you, so write it. Memorize it, know it, so that you can write it. Then, you have to think, hmm, Calculate Q for the reaction, so that's why I said this, you're trying to find Q. Mass, it's talking about water, it gave you information about water, it gave you the temperature of the water, it gave you the information regarding water. So, this is the mass of the water. Why are we not talking about the mass of the paper? First, we didn't give you the mass of the paper, and second, who cares? We're going to get it from the water. Because the energy gained by the water equals the energy lost by the paper. So if we know the energy that the water absorbed, that's equal to the energy the paper lost. We just get it from the water. So that's why we use the mass of the water. This will be given to you on a table. You don't need to memorize it, but this is just assume you've got a reference table and you can get this off of that reference table. So that's where this came from, a reference table. And then this came from the temperatures given. 22.6 degrees to 25.8. Now, notice the temperature rose, so we subtract these however we have to in order to force it to be a positive number. So the bigger number is the smog is a positive number. All right, again, because the temperature rose. So once that's done, we can solve for Q. So we plug the numbers into the equation, and Q equals the mass of the water times the specific heat capacity of the water times the delta T of the water. Again, it's absolutely mandatory to write units with all of your numbers and correct units 
And notice they cancel. Gram cancels gram. Degrees Celsius cancels degrees Celsius, leaving just joules for your answer, which is good. That's exactly what we're supposed to have. It gives that many joules. Okay, now um, that's not our final answer yet because let me look at our. Look, I mean, let me look at our numbers. Okay, we, we got some rounding to do, but um, here's the thing to consider: when it comes to like all this kind of a thing, the thing we're going to be looking at is this idea that Q for water equals negative Q of the reaction. So we have to understand that. When you burn the paper, I'll draw like a little fire there. That is a terrible little fire, but you get the idea. It releases energy into the water. So if the water is ener if the fire releases energy, its energy goes down. The water absorbs that energy, the energy goes up. So if the fire releases X joules, X number of joules, the water gains X number of joules, and vice versa. So if the water gained that many joules, it's because the the thing lost this many joules. The paper lost that many joules. Now, a little thing about rounding. Why are we rounding it like this? This is because with temperature, strange things happen when we find delta T, so we're not going to count delta T for our significant figures. So anyway, there's that. All right, now for a question that sometimes people find to be rather challenging and does require a few steps, though we've taken piece by piece and manageable pieces, it's not too bad. A piece of metal with a mass of 7.5 grams is heated to 200.0 degrees Celsius before being dropped into 100.0 grams of water. This causes the water's temperature to rise from 21.1 to 30.8 degrees Celsius. What is the specific heat capacity of the metal? Okay, so you're seeing a change in temperature and it is involving um, specific heat capacity. That's how you know you're using this equation, because it's the only thing you have that involves change in temperature and specific heat capacity. So it's asking for the specific heat capacity of the metal, which means you need the delta T of the metal. You need the mass of the metal, and you need the amount of energy for the metal. So the mass of the metal is going to come from here. That's fine. And then The delta T of the metal, it says the metal was 200.0 degrees Celsius. When you drop hot metal into water, the water starts out, the water and the metal start out at different temperatures, but they end up at the same. So the metal's temperature will come way down, the water's temperature will rise a bit, and they'll meet in the middle, they'll wind up exactly the same. So you are going to find that whatever the final temperature of the water is, the metal will be that exact same final temperature. So that's why this is the metal starting temperature, this is the metal's ending temperature, same as the water. Because when you drop the metal into the water, they're gonna wind up at the same temperature. All right, now, um, the next thing here to look at is, why did I put this way? Because we're solving for C, the specific heat capacity, but in order to solve for C, you need to know what Q is in order to have rearrange and put, plug in the numbers and then solve for C. But the problem is it does not anywhere here tell you what Q is. So you have an unsolvable problem right now because you have Q equals 7.5 grams times C times 160, negative 169.2 degrees Celsius. But you do not know how, the, how you're going to get these. So we got to figure something out. Hmm. Well, we know something about this. Now remember, this whole thing is dropping metal into a container of water. So there's your water. I don't know what happened to that container. Oopsie do. But your metal chunk goes in. This was hot. This was cold. Now they're at the same temperature. Your metal chunk is in there. And here's the thing. The metal went from 200 to a lower temperature because it was losing energy. The water gained energy and they wound up at the same temperature. That's because the number of joules lost by the metal is equal to the number of joules gained by the water. So here's the thing. We could do some calculation here to get our answer. If the energy of the metal is the opposite of the energy of the water, then we can solve for Q for the water because, consider this, 
do we have the Q equals MC delta T for the water? So if Q equals MC delta T, we've got the mass of the water. We know the specific heat capacity of water. It's in the data table. Look it up. And the delta T of the water, it goes from, it rises from 21.1 to 30.8. So if we can find the Q of the metal, then Q of the metal is equal to, Q, sorry, this is Q of the water, because mass of the water, specific heat capacity of water, delta T for water gives Q of water. So if we know how much energy the water gained, that's equal to the amount the metal lost. So if we find Q for the water, we know Q for the metal, and then we can plug it into the equation and get our answer for Q. So let's do that. We're going to Q equals MC delta T. M equals 100 grams of water. Specific heat capacity is given in the reference table. And then delta T is the water started at this temperature and rose to this temperature. So it's a positive 9.7 degrees Celsius. Remember, it's not going to influence our rounding now. Ignore sig figs for uh, temperature, and at least delta T. And so um, what we do now is we look at solving for Q. So one, Q equals 100 grams of water times specific heat capacity of water times the amount of temperature change the water had. And the water absorbed 4,058 degrees, sorry, 4,058 joules. We're not rounding because we're not done yet. So if the water absorbed 4,058 joules, then the metal lost 4,058 joules because they wind up at the same temperature because However, when you put that hot metal into water, all the energy comes out of the metal and into the water. So the energy gained by the water is equal to the energy lost by the metal. So for that reason, we can now say for the metal now, for the metal, Q equals MC delta T. Q is negative 4,058 joules because if the water gained 4,058 joules, the metal lost 4,058 joules. So the metal lost 4,058 joules. It had a mass of 7.5 grams. It were asked for the specific heat capacity, so we're gonna find it. And then delta T, it started at 200. It got put in with the water, so it ended up at the same temperature of 30.8 at the end. So that's what this is. We subtract and we find the metal's temperature went down by negative, went down by 169.2 degrees Celsius. And we're going to rearrange mathematically for this one. So Q equals MC delta T, pardon my sloppy M, and sloppy T. So we're going to divide by M delta T on both sides. M cancels M, delta cancels delta T, cancels T, leaving just C. So M. Q over M delta T equals C for the metal. So Q over M delta T equals C. We plug in the numbers. The metal lost 4,058 joules. It had a mass of 7.5 grams, and its temperature went down by 169.2. Notice these are both negatives, so the negatives cancel each other out to make a positive number. So this divided by this, divided by these, multiplied by each other, um, is equal to that. So, uh, oh, and that's our answer, by the way. I'll round that off. Now, I did not round anything prior to this stage. Why is it rounded to two significant figures? It's because of this right here. Okay, don't worry about this. Um, I know that this was an unrounded calculation before, but like I said, you don't round anything until the final step. So it's only at the end that you start, that you finish by doing your rounding. So that would be our specific heat capacity of the metal, and then theoretically you could even identify it, because if you had a list of specific heat capacities, you could match that to your list and see which metal it is. And that's how we go about doing it, is, again, we get this uh, energy from the water, and then plug it into the metal equation, and then solve for the metal. And that's how it's done.